On Wednesday, November 15th, 2023, the Congregation for the Doctrine of Faith published a decree upholding the traditional Catholic position banning Catholics from joining Freemasonic lodges or other similar organizations associated with the Freemasons. Around the same time, one social media account started to release a series of videos showing a ceremony of a member of a Freemason lodge being initiated as a Master Mason. The Freemasons have a hierarchical structure to it, and the different levels of Freemasonry are referred to as degrees. There are 33 degrees to the Freemasonic hierarchy, and anyone at or above the third degree is called a Master Mason. Normally, Freemasonic rituals are secret. They are not allowed to be recorded, and descriptions or recordings of these rituals are not allowed to be disseminated publicly. In fact, Master Masons even take a vow of secrecy, vowing not to share any of the secrets of the Order of Freemasons. Leaked footage of an important Masonic ritual thus piqued a lot of people's interest. Now, why are the Freemasons so secretive? What do they believe? Why do they exist? How did they come into being in the first place? Why has the Catholic Church condemned the Freemasonry for most of the group's history? To understand this, we have to go back to the beginning. The Freemasons have a rather benign and uncontroversial, albeit somewhat obscure, set of origins. Freemasonry was actually connected with the craft of Masonry. Masons are essentially just people who build things with stones and bricks. In the medieval period, the term Freeman Mason, often shortened to Freemason, was a Mason who achieved a certain level of skill, and was therefore allowed to join a guild. Guilds were union-like organizations formed among merchants and skilled laborers for the sake of mutual support. Guilds were often based in specific cities, towns, or villages, but often had connections to guilds in the same field located in other communities. Members of guilds had certain rights and privileges that were not given to other Masons, including the right to work on some of the higher level or more intricate parts of stonework, and the right to move from place to place looking for work. The first recorded use of the term Freemason goes back to between the 12th and 14th centuries. In spite of its more practical origins, relatively early on, a series of intricate symbols and myths starts to develop among Masons, giving a deeper moral, spiritual, and even mystical meaning to their craft. For example, one medieval poem, known as the Regius Poem, was written sometime in the 14th or 15th centuries and stated that the basic principles of masonry were passed on from generation to generation going all the way back to ancient times. Since being good at masonry presupposes a knowledge of geometry, the Regius poem traces the craft of masonry back to Euclid of Alexandria, an ancient Greek mathematician, who did much to lay the groundwork for modern-day geometry. This trend of adding a symbolic and quasi-historical meaning to various elements of the craft of masonry, and developing an intricate mythology surrounding it, was further solidified in the late 16th century due to a man named William Shaw. William Shaw was the master of work. The term master of works simply referring to a high-ranking political official in the medieval and early modern periods in Scotland, who was appointed by the king to oversee various large-scale government infrastructure projects. William Shaw published his own edition of a famous Masonic text known as the Old Charges, which contained a series of regulations that Masons were bound to follow and which developed a whole series of myths on the origins of the craft of Masonry tracing it back to the earliest days of the human race. 
claiming that the basic principles of masonry were developed by Lamech, one of the descendants of Adam according to the book of Genesis, and was further developed by Hermes Trismegistus, an ancient Greek deity who was seen as the revealer of wisdom, as well as Euclid. Over time, this mythology was expanded, and it came to be claimed, according to some versions of the myth, that masonry was something handed on from those who worked on Noah's Ark, the Tower of Babel, the pyramids of ancient Egypt, as well as the members of various esoteric movements, such as the Dionysian and ancient Egyptian mystery religions, ancient Celtic paganism, particularly the Druids, who were ancient Celtic priests, the Gnostics, the practitioners of alchemy, and the practitioners of Kabbalah, Kabbalah being one stream of Jewish mystical thoughts. Some scholars claim that these myths were also influenced by a revival in Neoplatonic thought. Platonism, that is, the system of philosophy put forward by Plato, stated that there were forms, that is, broad standards or archetypes of how a thing is or should be. There's a form of a house, a form of human, a form of cars, etc. Matter was inherently formless and chaotic, until a force, known as the Demiurge, made each particular piece of matter conform to a specific form, thereby giving it order. Neoplatonism was a school of thought developed by later philosophers who sought to expand upon Plato's philosophical system. Many philosophers in the ancient world asked the question, where did the forms originate? Neoplatonists taught that there was a singular, universal basis of all of reality, referred to as the One. The One was completely transcendent, and could not be completely imitated by or encapsulated by anything else. The One turned in on itself and produced the intelligence, which reflected the One, but to a lesser degree. Everything in the One is reflected in the intelligence, but to a degree far more limited and far less perfect than in the One. The intelligence then turned in on itself and produced another entity that was a lesser reflection of itself, known as the soul. The soul was far enough away from the One, in terms of its perfections, that certain signs of the perfection of the One were absent in the soul, including its simplicity. Simplicity is a metaphysical term, meaning that a thing lacks parts. Because the soul lacked simplicity, Within the soul there existed multiplicity, that is, the existence of distinct parts, and the different parts of the soul were known as the forms. So, the Neoplatonist had what is often referred to as an emanationist cosmology, that is, a view of reality wherein every part of the universe comes forth from, or originates from another, more fundamental, and more perfect part of reality. In the Neoplatonist view, matter, physical, material stuff, is the lowest part of reality. But by virtue of having an organized, intelligible structure, it imitates the forms. The forms are different parts of the soul, and the soul is a lesser reflection of the intelligence, which itself, which itself comes forth from, and reflects in a finite degree, the One, which is the source or foundation of all reality. Matter reflects the forms, and therefore the soul, which reflects the intelligence, which reflects the One. Therefore, the lesser parts of reality reflect, in a finite manner, the greater parts of reality. In the medieval and early modern periods, there was a revival of interest in Neoplatonic thought. 
Philosophers influenced by Neoplatonism asserted that every part of the world, even the material realm, had intelligibility or order to it because it reflected a higher part of reality. There was thus a close connection between the physical and the spiritual, the sensible and the intelligible. Now while this reality was accepted by most forms of even Western theology and spirituality, among medieval and early modern Neoplatonists, this idea of there being a close connection between the physical and the spiritual was often interpreted in terms of there being a hidden, spiritual influence at work in every part of reality. Thus, even mundane things like colors, numbers, letters, or symbols could have a hidden mystical meaning. Thus, during the Renaissance, there was a revival of magic and alchemy, which sought to harness the secret spiritual powers found in the natural or physical elements. The myths and symbols associated with Freemasonry were thus, according to some scholars, born out of the Renaissance tendency to add symbolic, mystical meanings to normal, day-to-day -day parts of life. Freemasonry, as we know it today, originated in the British Isles, with some of the earliest Freemasonic texts and institutions being from England and Scotland. Over time, Freemasonry spread into continental Europe, where it accepted a lot of the same symbols and ideology, though it developed in its own unique direction. And eventually, continental Freemasonry broke off from Anglophone Masonry. In the British Isles, various Freemasonic organizations began to more and more strongly emphasize the symbolic and mythical elements of their organization. Don't forget, the Freemasons were originally a union-like organization among stone workers, and the symbolic or mythical elements of their organization were sort of a secondary element of the nature and goals of these groups. Part of the reason why the emphasis began to shift towards prioritizing the symbolic or mythical elements of Freemasonry has to do with the Protestant Reformation. Protestants tended to place much less emphasis on rituals and sacraments in favor of preaching and communal Bible reading. This, combined with the rather simple nature of the rituals that they did perform, and the rather plain nature of Protestant church architecture, led a lot of people in the British Isles, which relatively early on in the Reformation became predominantly Protestant, to seek some sort of alternative. Freemasonry, with its initiation rituals, rituals surrounding the promotion of people through the various ranks of Freemasonry, its burial rituals, as well as its heavy use of symbolism and complex mythology, was seen as fulfilling the desire among some British Christians, who at this point were only a few generations removed from their Catholic pre-Reformation ancestors for symbolic rituals. Their symbolic connection with various historical and mythical figures, as well as certain biblical figures and saints, was seen by some as replacing the practice of venerating the saints. Their highly structured hierarchy was seen as a counterbalance to the more decentralized ecclesial structures of Protestantism. It was these same elements that made Freemasonry quite popular during the Enlightenment. The Enlightenment, at best, had no problem with religion, but took issue with organized institutional religion, and at worst, gave birth to many of the trends in modern-day and contemporary atheism. So in the aftermath of the Reformation, and even more so during the Enlightenment, people sought certain things that were lost with the decline of Catholicism and later the decline of organized religion more generally in the English-speaking world. This partly led to the massive increase in the popularity of Freemasonry in the late 16th and 17th centuries. The growth of Freemasonry in the modern era 
was thus a response to certain elements of both Protestantism and the Enlightenment. As a result, during this time period, the ideological elements of Freemasonry started to overshadow its historical connections to the actual craft of Masonry. The connections between Freemasonic organizations and the actual craft of Masonry is known as practical Freemasonry. But the myths and symbols surrounding Freemasonry and the study of their deeper spiritual meaning is known as speculative Freemasonry. And so partly in response to the Reformation and the Enlightenment, there was a shift away from practical Freemasonry and towards speculative Freemasonry. But outside of the broad ideological trends, part of the reason for the shift away from practical Freemasonry and towards speculative Freemasonry was the result of certain practical economic issues. During the Reformation, there was an increase in the number of new Christian denominations. Yet, this did not always equate to an increase in the need for new churches. Many European communities that endorsed en masse Protestantism simply took the local Catholic church and converted it into a Protestant church. Sometimes, though rarely, Catholics and Protestants would share a church. Very often, many Protestant denominations placed a strong emphasis on physically small and or simply designed churches. Yet throughout the medieval period, since most people in Europe were Christian, and churches tended to be larger and more ornate, churches were some of the most time-consuming, yet most frequent and lucrative jobs for Masons. When, as a result of the Reformation, the need for building projects connected with churches either stagnated or declined, Masons started to lose money, and various Masonic organizations began to be in danger of dying out. Thus, throughout the late 16th and 17th centuries, those who were not Masons by trade were allowed to join various Masonic organizations as a way to sustain these organizations. Many of these individuals, who included among their ranks businessmen, bankers, and members of the nobility, brought with them money and resources that were used to sustain and expand upon the various Masonic organizations. Non-Masons who joined were known as Accepted Masons. Accepted Masons would spend their time studying the mythology and symbolism surrounding Masonry, and would attempt to systematize the underlying philosophical mindset inherent to them. As the number of accepted Masons in various Masonic organizations began to outnumber the number of those who were actual Masons by trade, there was a shift away from practical or operative Freemasonry to speculative Freemasonry. Now, the main places where Freemasons would meet and where the administrative and ritual functionings of the local Masonic community are based, is known as a lodge. Everyone who joins a lodge must undergo an initiation ceremony, and there are certain ceremonies associated with being promoted through the ranks of Freemasonry. Over the course of the 17th and early 18th century, four Freemasonic lodges formed in England. In 1717, representatives of the Four Lodges met at a tavern in London called the Goose and Gridiron, and as a result of this meeting, their Four Lodges merged together to form the Grand Lodge of London. The Grand Lodge of London was, and still is, the highest authority for Freemasonry in England. It originally had authority only over the City of London, but eventually came to have jurisdiction over all British Freemasonry. The Grand Lodge of London sought to standardize the teachings, rituals, and symbols of Freemasonry. Many of the ceremonies associated with Freemasonry, at least in the English-speaking world, were first developed at the Grand Lodge of London. One member of the Grand Lodge of London was James Anderson. Anderson, who lived from 1679 to 1739, 
was a Scottish-born writer, historian, and Presbyterian minister who eventually became a member of the Freemasons. In 1721, Anderson was committed to write a text outlining the basic teachings and rituals of the Freemasons, which he completed in 1723 with the publication of the text The Constitutions of the Freemasons, which was seen as one of the most authoritative texts for English Freemasonry. Most Masons prior to this point identified as Christians, and most of the teachings and symbolism of the Freemasons were either explicitly Christian in nature or were often interpreted in a Christian manner. The Constitutions of the Freemasons was deeply rooted in the Enlightenment view on religion, which claimed that there are certain religious principles that are known and accepted by all men of goodwill and would serve as the spiritual kernel to all religions, and that the spiritual life consisted in creating a sense of spiritual brotherhood between members of different religions and downplaying any differences between them. As a result of these two different views, the more conservative members of the Freemasons formed a rival lodge called the Ancient Lodge of England in 1751, which remained its own distinct organization until it merged with the Grand Lodge of London in 1813. The Ancient Grand Lodge of England intended to preserve the specifically Christian heritage of the Freemasons and claimed that it was the heir to the earliest Freemasons in England, claiming to trace its roots back to the first meeting of Freemasons in England in the 10th century. It was with the creation of the Grand Lodge of London that Freemasonry in its modern form came into being. And it was with the rise of modern Freemasonry that the Masons began to exhibit a lot of the beliefs and qualities that the Catholic Church and even other Christian groups would later come to see as problematic. Within a little over 20 years after the founding of the Grand Lodge of London, Freemasonry spread like wildfire throughout Europe, with Freemasonic lodges being established in France in 1725, Ireland in 1729, Spain in 1730, Italy in 1731, Sweden in 1735, Scotland and Germany in 1736, Austria and Poland in 1742, and Denmark in 1743. During this time, Freemasonry also began to spread to the British colonies in America, with the first Freemasonic Lodge being established in Pennsylvania in 1730, and the second being established in 1733 in Boston. Just as a side note, there are three main branches of Freemasonry. They differ slightly in their rituals and hierarchical structure, but share most of the same beliefs. There's the York Rites, the Scottish Rites, and the Grand Orient Lodge. The York Rite and the Scottish Rite are found primarily in the British Isles and in the former British colonies, though they do have members elsewhere. The Grand Orient Lodge refers to the various forms of Freemasonry that developed in continental Europe. The Grand Orient Lodge was originally under the jurisdiction of the Grand Lodge of London until the early 1770s. In spite of its progressively non-Christian bent, Freemasonry found members from among both Catholics and non-Catholics alike. One example would be the famous composer Mozart. Mozart, who was raised in a devout Catholic family, and who identified as a Catholic throughout his life, joins the Freemasons in 1784, and this kind of makes sense, considering that the period between 1780 and 1785, which partly overlapped with the height of Mozart's popularity on the cultural scene in Vienna, was often described as the quote-unquote golden age of Freemasonry in that area. Mozart even wrote music to be used for various events taking place at local Masonic lodges, and many of his friends and acquaintances among the political and cultural elites in Vienna were Freemasons. Even some of the musicians that he frequently associated with 
were Freemasons. And not only that, but some historical commentators believe that Mozart associated with the Freemasons not as a sign of rebellion against his Catholic faith, but rather saw no tension between the liberal, theist, and universalistic tendencies of Freemasonry and his own Catholic faith. <laughs> when Freemasonry first spread into Italy, the Holy See commanded an investigation of the various organizations connected with Freemasonry. In 1738, Pope Clement XII published the document In Eminenti Apostolatis, in which he prohibited Catholics from joining the Freemasons. This same document also prohibited Catholics from supporting various Freemasonic lodges in any way, such as financially, as well as assisting at Freemasonic rituals or any Freemason-related functions, and also prohibited those in positions of authority from permitting or encouraging the Freemasons to meet or form lodges in their jurisdiction. The punishment for violating these regulations was excommunication. In total, the Freemasons were condemned over 20 times by at least 12 different popes. Membership in Freemasonic lodges was also explicitly prohibited in the 1917 edition of the Code of Canon Law, as well as implicitly in the 1982 edition of the Code of Canon Law. The Catholic Church was not alone in its condemnation of Freemasonry. Due to its decentralized hierarchical structure, there is no singular opinion or doctrine concerning the Freemasons among Protestants. With some Protestants, and even some Protestant clergy joining the Freemasons. Nonetheless, criticism or suspicion of Freemasons is not uncommon among some more conservative evangelical as well as fundamentalist Protestant circles. It says it's a shame to even speak of those things which are done of them in secret, and I want to focus on that word secret. Anytime you have a secret society or a secretive organization, that is a sign of wickedness. When you look at the local church here as an institution or any Bible-believing Baptist church, transparency is there. You don't have to get inducted into higher levels to learn the doctrine of the church. The church openly proclaims its doctrine. All of our teachings are exposed to the world. There's no secret that you learn after one year or five years or ten years. It's all just out there. Listen to what this degree teaches. This degree proclaims the spiritual unity of all who believe in God and cherish the hope of immortality no matter what religious leader they follow or what creed they profess. It's concerned pri primarily with the perennial conflict between light and darkness, good and evil, God and Savior. Did you hear that? The spiritual unity of all who believe in God no matter what religious leader they follow. Meaning that you could follow Buddha, you could follow Jesus, you could follow Muhammad, as long as you just believe in God. Let me tell you something. There is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved than the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. And the Bible says, whosoever denieth the Son, meaning Jesus, the Son of God, the same hath not the Father. But he that acknowledgeth the Son hath the Father also. If you're worshiping a God, and you're not believing on the Lord Jesus Christ is a false God because no man cometh by the, unto the Father but by Jesus. And if you deny Jesus, you don't have the Father, you have another Father, you have another false God. And so this teaching is an ecumenical, new world order, one world government, one world religion. Let's all join together the spiritual unity of all religions. It's wicked. The Bible says, come out from among them and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I'll receive you, and you'll be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord. Some branches of Lutheranism, at least in the United States, including, for example, the Lutheran Church of the Missouri Synod and the Wisconsin Evangelical Lutheran Synod, ban Freemasons from joining their churches. Many branches of Eastern Orthodoxy 
also prohibit their members from joining the Freemasons. For example, in 1933, the Greek Orthodox Church prohibited membership in the Freemasons among its adherents. The Orthodox Church of America, or OCA, also prohibits its members from joining the Freemasons. Yet, what is it about the Freemasons, more specifically, what is it about their beliefs or practices, that elicits such a strong response from the Catholic Church and from many other religions? As the philosopher, mystic, and Freemason Manly P. Hall wrote in his text, The Lost Keys of Freemasonry, quote, Masonry is essentially a religious order. Most of its legends and allegories are of a sacred nature, unquote. He goes on to say, quote, Much of Masonry is woven into the very structure of Christianity, unquote. The reason why Freemasonry uses a lot of traditional Christian and Biblical imagery, he states, is because Christianity is the dominant religion in the West. But there are certain spiritual and moral truths expressed in Christianity that Christianity shares with all religions. Hall goes on to say that the term spiritual truth refers to those ideas, beliefs, or doctrines that seek to give expression to the divine spark within man, sometimes called spirits, and that religions are named after the specific teacher who articulated these spiritual truths. The scriptural belief that Christ is the Word of God made flesh is one such fundamental spiritual truth. For the Word of God, according to Hall, exists within the soul of each man, and for the Word to be made flesh is for the flesh to be conformed to the Word and therefore reflect its glory. This happens when we begin to see past the illusions that dominate our vision of reality and see the truth as it really is, something that all religions strive towards. Freemasonry allows us to see past the partial and often symbolic ways in which spiritual truth is presented in most religion, and to see the spiritual truths which all religions are attempting to articulate. Freemasonry is thus, fundamentally, perennialist in nature. As Hall writes, quote, The shrines of masonry are ornamented by the jewels of a thousand ages. Its rituals ring with the words of enlightened seers and illumined sages. A hundred religions have brought their gifts of wisdom to its altar. Arts and sciences unnumbered have contributed to its symbolism. It is more than a faith. It is a path of certainty. Masonry is a religion which is essentially creedless. It is all the truer because of this. Its brothers bow to truth regardless of its bearer. They serve the light instead of wrangling over the one who brings it. In this way, they prove that they are seeking to know better the will and the dictates of the Invincible One. No truer religion exists in all the world than that all creatures gather together in comradeship and brotherhood for the purpose of glorifying God, and of building for Him a temple of constructive attitude and noble character." Unquote. A similar set of beliefs can also be found in the writings of Albert Mackey. Mackey was an American-born doctor and author who was also a member of the Freemasons. Mackey wrote many books attempting to explain the symbolism and beliefs of Masonry. Mackey notes, in one of his writings, how one common symbol for Freemasonry was the acacia tree. Mackey notes how, since the acacia tree is a type of evergreen tree, it is thus used by Freemasons as a symbol for the immortality of the soul, and more specifically how the soul achieves immortality through a life of faith and moral uprightness. Since the term acacia is derived from the Greek term acacia, which had two unrelated meanings, 
The term acacia could refer to the acacia tree, but also meant purity. The acacia tree was also a symbol for moral or spiritual purity. Finally, the acacia tree, as well as similar plants, were used as a symbol for being initiated into a religion or order dedicated to promoting an esoteric system of thought. Such was the case with the Adonic mystery religions of ancient Greece, the Brahmanical orders of ancient India, the Brahmin being essentially the priests of Hinduism, as well as among the Druids of ancient Egypt. Thus, Mackey goes on to say, quote, In all of these ancient mysteries, while the sacred plant was the symbol of initiation, the initiation itself was symbolic of the resurrection to a future life, and of the immortality of the soul. In this view, Freemasonry is to us now in the place of the ancient initiations." Unquote. Freemasonry not only claims that all religions have a common spiritual or esoteric core to all of them, which all religions, through its symbols, attempt to give expression to, it also claims to be the successor or modern-day expression of the mystery and pagan religions of ancient times. Mackey says something similar in his work The Symbolism of Freemasonry, in which he taught that the ancient Egyptian mystery religions delve into the mysteries of death, understanding that death is not the same as non-existence, but rather is the means by which the spirit leaves the body and takes part in closer union with God, and thus death is a pathway to fuller life. This is also something found in a lot of ancient Near Eastern religions as they spoke of the myths of their gods dying and rising from the dead, which the Masons saw as a symbol for spiritual rebirth. In the Bible, it says that King Solomon asks the king of Tyre to send workmen to Jerusalem to build the temple. Mackey points out that, according to Freemasonic legends, what builders from Tyre coming to Jerusalem represents is people from throughout the world gathering at Jerusalem to bring the spiritual wisdom of their respective mystery religions and synthesize them together into a singular, unified system of thoughts. This series of spiritual doctrines were passed on from one generation to the next among stonemasons, using a series of very specific and intricate symbols and myths, which eventually morphed into modern-day Freemasonry. In a word, what Mackey is claiming here is that Freemasonry is the direct descendant of these ancient mystery religions found in a lot of ancient Near Eastern cultures which were eventually synthesized together and passed on secretly before evolving into modern-day Freemasonry. Thus, many Freemasons in the English-speaking world, especially in Great Britain and America, have frequently affirmed the notion that Freemasonry is not a religion, but rather is a secular organization with religious undertones meant not so much to serve as an alternative to mainstream religion but rather meant to bolster the already existing sense of faith found in its members. In spite of that, some scholars associated with Freemasonry have defined Freemasonry as, in fact, being a religion, defining it variously in terms of being an all-inclusive or universal religion, that is, a religion that articulates those truths at the core of all religion, or conversely, as a wisdom religion, similar to the mystery religions in ancient Greece, Rome, and Egypt. One high-ranking 19th century British Freemason, W. M. Charlieb, stated that the foundational spiritual and moral principles of Freemasonry transcend religious and cultural boundaries, under the banner of which all of humanity could be united. He thus described Freemasonry as the, quote, grand primeval and foundational religion, unquote, and as the, quote, universal lodge of nature, unquote. Freemasonry is essentially perennialist in nature. 
it claims that all religions share a common spiritual core. This is different from the Catholic view, which states that while the human mind, unaided by grace, can know some truths about God, and therefore most religions contain some elements of truth to them, Catholicism is based on the fullest expression of God to humanity, as recorded in sacred scripture and sacred tradition and infallibly interpreted by the magisterium of the church. Insofar as the Catholic Church contains the fullness of divine revelation, it affirms certain spiritual and moral truths which are very often either rejected or misinterpreted by other religions. Thus Catholicism, or Christianity more generally, is not saying the same thing as other religions, just in different terms. As a result of being perennialist in nature, Freemasonry is also indifferentist in nature. Indifferentism is the belief that all religions are equally true. According to the Freemasons, since all religions share the same spiritual and moral core, all religions are equally valid paths to heaven. Besides its perennialist and indifferentist tendencies, Freemasonry has also held at least in the past, to a very strongly secularist political view. This has often expressed itself in anti-Catholic or anti-clerical terms. This was true especially with some of the organizations that branched off from, were associated with, or were influenced by the Freemasons. Take for example Mexico. Since the 16th century, Mexico had been a majority Catholic nation and Catholicism has played a big role in the culture of that nation. In spite of this, certain elements of the intelligentsia were influenced by the political ideology of the Enlightenment. Thus, there have long been tensions between traditionalists and radicals in Mexico, with the former desiring to maintain close ties between the church and the state, or the culture more generally, and the latter wanting to curtail the influence of the church in the public realm. Some Freemasonic sources take credit for the successes that liberals made in the political history of Mexico, as well as for the general cultural trends among Mexicans that made it be more open to, at least when compared to other Latin American nations, non-Catholic leaders. Oscar J. Salinas, a Grand Warden for the York Rite in Mexico, once noted that it is commonly accepted that the Freemasons played a major role in the creation of a secular classical liberal society in Mexico, one rooted in the economic and political ideologies of modernity, with a strong influence from individualism and where the secular and religious spheres were separate. Salinas, more specifically, noted that while some early Mexican Freemasons saw no conflict between their faith and membership in Freemasonry, one example being Father Miguel Hidalgo, a Mexican Catholic priest and leader of the Mexican Revolution, it quickly became evident that it was difficult to balance Freemasonry and Catholicism. For example, shortly after the establishment of the Mexican Republic in the 1820s, two political parties formed with radically different views on how the newly formed Mexican state should be organized. The conservative party, on the one hand, believed in a highly centralized republic with close ties to the church, organized along corporatist lines. Corporatism being the political ideology that states that society is analogous to a body. With the different segments of society, such as industrial workers, skilled laborers, professionals, the military or farmers, representing different parts of society and being represented by union-like organizations that advocate before the government. On the other hand, the Liberal Party influenced by the political ideals of the Enlightenment, which tended to view the government in more libertarian terms, 
often supported a federalist approach, that is, a system of government in which the federal government's authority was curtailed by dividing it into different houses or branches, and putting in place various mechanisms that helped to prevent one house of the government or one branch of the government from becoming too powerful, as well as attempting to create a balance between federal and local authority. The Liberal Party was also a strong supporter of the separation of church and state. While Freemasons were found among the ranks of both parties, there was a much higher representation of Freemasons within the Liberal Party. In the early days of the Mexican Republic, Liberals gained enough of an influence in the government to leave a definite mark on the Mexican Constitution which enshrined many of their basic principles, including those that attempted to curtail the influence of the church, such as the separation of church and states, the nationalization of church property, and absolute freedom of religion, including for non-Catholics or non-Christians. Freemasons in Mexico were generally supportive of these trends. This includes one early Mexican leader, Porfirio Diaz. While nominally a supporter of liberalism, he went against many of the principles of classical liberalism by quickly showing himself to be a dictator, and in fact, one of the most repressive dictators in Mexican history. Yet, while generally undermining most liberal principles, Diaz, who was also a Freemason, strongly supported one liberal policy in specific, namely secularism. The anti-clerical trends among Freemasons were also strong among Freemasons in continental Europe. We see this, for example, in the official stance of the Grand Orient Lodge of France, one of the largest branches of Freemasonry in that area. In the late 18th century, the French Revolution took place which showed the overthrow of the French monarchy and the establishment of a republican-style government. Because the church and state had close ties to each other in the pre-revolutionary government of France, the new French Republic passed a series of laws restricting the activity of the Catholic Church in France. Over the course of the 19th and early 20th centuries, many of these regulations persisted. This included a series of laws declaring all church property to be the property of the states, the outlawing of the wearing of religious symbols in public, and the suppression of private schools, something meant to undermine the activity of Catholic schools in that area. In the period between the two world wars, these laws continued, but were not enforced, at least not as strictly or consistently. There was thus an increase in the number of Catholic schools in France, though, to escape the ire of the states, many of them were run by the laity, and many of the clergy or religious among their teachers and administrators often dressed as laymen so as not to be ousted by the states. In spite of the fact that growth in membership in the Grand Orient Lodge was slow in the period between the 1910s and the 1930s, and Freemasonry was eventually highly regulated during the fascist occupation of France in the 1940s, French Freemasons despised the growth of Catholic schools and the relaxing of the anti-clerical laws in France. In fact, even though the Masons, on the one hand, and leftist political parties, on the other, were two distinct, unconnected organizations, they often had much agreement. For example, part of the reason why the anti-clerical laws were not enforced as strictly as before was due to their decrease in popularity among French politicians outside of certain leftist circles. Nonetheless, both leftist politicians as well as Freemasons continued to support, very often publicly, anti-clerical laws. For example, in 1899, representatives of the Grand Orient Lodge proposed before the French Parliament a series of laws that suggested 
that all private schools be closed and that no one be allowed to enter into civil service if they had not graduated from a state-run school. These laws were eventually rejected. Ironically, in 1937, the official librarian of the Grand Orient Lodge of France sent a letter to Pope Pius XI, who published two encyclicals against fascism, one against the fascist party in Italy, another against the Nazi party in Germany, asking to form an alliance against the Nazis. This letter was met with much hostility by both fellow Freemasons as well as among members of the Catholic Church. Something similar was found in Italy. Strongly anti-clerical policies were supported by an Italian secret society known as the Carbonari. The Carbonari, which had strong influences from Freemasonry, were deeply involved in the Italian unification movement. The term Carbonari is Italian for coal miners or coal workers. The origins of the Carbonari are uncertain. There are a variety of hypotheses that exist among scholars. Some say that the Carbonari have a history similar to the Freemasons, originating from a very specific, very practical organization that evolved into a speculative, quasi-political, quasi-religious organization. The Carbonari supposedly originated in Central Europe in the Middle Ages as a union-like organization among coal miners. Others speculate that the organization originated among various secret societies that formed in France in the medieval or early modern era. Some have suggested that the Carbonari were descended from various radical political groups that formed in France that, after their defeat or suppression, took shelter in some of the territories immediately surrounding France, including Italy. Others provide a more mythological or even religious origin to it. Some Carbonari legends trace their origins to King Philip of Macedonia, the father of Alexander the Great. While others say that the organization was founded in Switzerland in the 11th century by Saint Theobald, and was originally an organization meant to protect and provide shelter for travelers. Some have suggested that the Carbonari were founded by the Queen of Naples as a way to undermine French attempts to expand into Italy. The most probable theory is that the Carbonari are actually of British origin. Many historians assert that the Carbonari were an offshoot of Scottish Rite Freemasonry which was introduced to Italy by way of Malta, which, as a side note, from the early 19th century until the 1960s was a British colony. Others assert that Scottish Rite Freemasonry was introduced to Italy by British troops stationed off the coast of southern Italy. These theories are but some of the many that attempt to connect the Carbonari with Freemasons or similar groups something that has a lot of, at least, circumstantial evidence to support it. A lot of symbols and rituals found among the Carbonari were similar to those found among the Illuminati and, even more so, the Freemasons. Christian symbols were also quite common among the Carbonari, and in fact were extremely pervasive in some Carbonari circles. The thing is, like with Freemasonry, these symbols were often interpreted in a way that was not in line with the traditional meaning that these symbols had within Christian theology and spirituality, but rather reflected the underlying ideology of the Carbonari, which tended to be more esoteric in nature. According to Carbonari documents, the purpose of the society was to prepare its members to fight against totalitarian regimes. According to some at that time, the Carbonari were far more radical. They were not simply anti-totalitarian, but were rather, in fact, anarchistic in nature, hoping to overthrow all forms of government as well as most forms of organized religion. The Carbonari were particularly secretive, and very few documents or records associated with them exist especially those connected with the upper echelons of their organization. 
What we do know is that the Carbonari had a strong secularist and anti-clerical bent to them. In fact, the Carbonari were also deeply involved in the Italian unification movement. In fact, such well-known supporters of the Italian unification movement as Giuseppe Mazzini were also high-ranking Carbonari. Now, one big issue faced by the Italian unification movement was the role of the Catholic Church in the newly unified Italian state. The majority of Italy's population was Catholic, and thus Catholicism played a big role in Italian culture. Not only that, the Catholic Church in Italy had not only a strong ideological or cultural influence, but also a strong political one. Large chunks of land in Italy were once directly owned by the Pope. These territories, known as the Papal States, were directly subject to the authority of the Pope, such that the Pope was not only their highest spiritual leader, but also their highest political or legal authority. Some supporters of the Italian unification movement believed that there should be a close tie between the Italian state and the church, with some wanting the Pope to serve as the King of Italy. Others rejected such a model. And when you look at those who rejected the notion that there should be a close connection between the church and the state, some of those took on a more secularist or anti-clerical view. Many of the more secularist supporters of the Italian unification movement were Carbonari. One document written by the Carbonari in the early 19th century was titled The Permanent Instruction and laid out the blueprint for how the Carbonari were to subvert the Catholic Church. The document called for the destruction of the Catholic Church from within. Members of the Carbonari would find ways to spread the ideals of the Enlightenment among seminaries and younger clergy, with the hopes of one day seeing the rise of a Pope who would promote these values on a large-scale level. The document itself says, quote, our ultimate end is that of Voltaire and the French Revolution, namely, the final destruction of Catholicism, and even of the Christian idea, unquote. It goes on to say, quote, The Pope, whoever he is, will never come to the secret societies. It is up to the secret societies to take their first step towards the Church, with the aim of conquering them both. We do not intend to win the Popes to our cause to make them neophytes of our principles, propagators of our ideas. What we must ask for, as the Jews await for the Messiah, is a Pope according to our needs. Now then, to assure ourselves a Pope of the required dimensions, it is a question of shaping for this Pope a generation worthy of the reign we are dreaming of. Leave old people and people of mature age aside. Go to the youth, and if it is possible, even to the children. You will contrive for yourselves, at a little cost, a reputation as good Catholics and pure patriots. This reputation will put access to our doctrines into the midst of the young clergy, as well as deeply into the monasteries. In a few years... By the force of things, this young clergy will have overrun all the functions. They will form the Sovereign's Council. They will be called to choose a pontiff who should reign. And this pontiff, like most of his contemporaries, will be necessarily more or less imbued with the revolutionary Italian and humanitarian principles that we are going to begin to put into circulation." Unquote. This document was made known to the Church in the 19th century, and two popes, Pope Pius IX and Pope Leo XIII, ordered that this document be mass-produced and circulated among the clergy, religious, and teachers of the faith. Now, what exactly was the Catholic response to Freemasonry? What were the specific issues that Catholics had with the Freemasons? Pope Leo XIII, in his anti-Masonic document Humanum Genus, 
notes that the Freemasons take a vow of secrecy in order to hide from the world, and even to some extent other, particularly lower-ranking members of their group, the true political, ideological, and religious intent of the organization. Their suspicious activity is often hidden under the guise of humanitarian efforts and the promotion of civil virtue. Yet, when one digs beneath the surface, one will note that the primary aim of the Freemasons is to promote certain heresies commonly associated with what would eventually go on to be labeled as modernism. In particular, the Freemasons support naturalism. Naturalism, as understood by the Freemasons, is not the denial of any creator being, but rather the belief that reason is the highest guide in understanding all spiritual and moral truth. They denied the concept of supernatural revelation, at least as traditionally understood by most Christians, and therefore denied the right or authority of the Church to infallibly define the proper interpretation or the limits of certain spiritual and moral truths. This then led to a broader, anti-clerical mindset in the political realm, which often manifested itself in a desire to limit the Church's influence in political, social, and cultural affairs, and a support for an absolute separation of Church and State. It is for this reason that Pope Leo asserted that the Freemasons often use subtle or cunning means by which to spread their influence or ideas. One example, as stated earlier, was their vow of secrecy. Another example is through taking people who may not necessarily be ill-disposed towards organized religion and convincing them of indifferentism, that is, a belief that all religions are equally true. Part of the reason why people of all religious backgrounds are accepted into the Freemasons is because Freemasonry teaches that all religions are equally valid paths to salvation and spiritual enlightenment, and Freemasonry is simply explicating or exposing those religious and spiritual truths common to all religions. By this, people are drawn into naturalist and esoteric views on religion without even necessarily knowing that that's what's going on. Something similar was said a few decades earlier by Pope Pius VII in his 1821 papal bull Ecclesium a Jesu, which was published in response to the Carbonari. He writes, quote, They simulate a singular respect and a certain extraordinary zeal towards the Catholic religion and towards the person and teachings of Jesus Christ our Savior, who they sometimes sacrilegiously dare the Karl Rector and great master of their society. Yet the Carbonari aim, above all else, to give full license to anyone to invent with their own ingenuity and with their own opinions a religion to profess, thus introducing towards religion that indifference than which one can scarcely imagine anything more pernicious. In profaning and contaminating the Passion of Jesus Christ with certain of their nefarious ceremonies, in despising the sacraments of the Church, which they seem to replace with new ones invented by them with supreme impiety, and the very mysteries of the Catholic religion, in subverting this apostolic see, in which the primacy of the apostolic chair has always resided, they are animated by a particular hatred and fatal and pernicious intentions. That society teaches that it is not a crime to foment rebellions and strip kings and other leaders of their power, which for supreme insult dares to call tyrants indifferently." Unquote. The Carbonari, in their public statements, will act as if they are loyal sons of the Church, and will even use Jesus Christ himself or certain symbols connected with Christianity more generally in their religious rituals. Nonetheless, the Freemasons support indifferentism, the belief that all religions are equally true, and reject the magisterial and sacramental authority of the Church, and advocate anarchism. 
an article published by the Italian Catholic newspaper La Salvatore Romano in 1985 summarized the traditional Catholic views on Freemasonry in the following manner. Quote, With regard to the affirmation of the irreconcilability between the principles of Freemasonry and the Catholic faith, from some parts are now heard the objection that essential to Freemasonry would be precisely the fact that it does not impose any principles, in the sense of a philosophical or religious position which is binding for all of its members, but rather that it gathers together, beyond the limits of various religions and worldviews, men of goodwill on the basis of humanistic values comprehensible and acceptable to everyone. Freemasonry would constitute a cohesive element for all those who believe in the architect of the universe and who feel committed with regard to those fundamental moral orientations which are defined, for example, in the Decalogue. It would not separate anyone from his religion, but on the contrary, would constitute an incentive to embrace that religion more strongly. The multiple historical and philosophical problems which are hidden in these affirmations cannot be discussed here. It is certainly not necessary to emphasize that following the Second Vatican Council, the Catholic Church too is pressing in the direction of collaboration between men of goodwill. Nevertheless, becoming a member of Freemasonry decidedly exceeds this legitimate collaboration and has a much more important and final significance than this." Unquote. It is for this reason that, according to the 1917 edition of the Code of Canon Law, Canon 2335, those who join the Freemasons or other similar organizations that historically conspired against the Church or promoted ideas contrary to those held by the Catholic faith are automatically excommunicated. It is further for this reason that the Code of Canon Law, Canon 1399, states that books promoting Freemasonry are to be outlawed, and according to the Code of Canon Law, Canon 1240, Section 1, Subsection 1, members of Masonic lodges were counted among those denied a Christian burial. Unfortunately, in recent years, there has been some confusion on this topic. The 1983 edition of the Code of Canon Law outlaws the joining of secret societies that plot against the church, but never explicitly mentioned Freemasons. According to the 1983 edition of the Code of Canon Law, Canon 1374, quote, a person who joins an association which plots against the church is to be punished with a just penalty. One who promotes or takes office in such an association is to be punished with interdict, unquote. The fact that Freemasons were not explicitly mentioned by name led to confusion concerning whether or not the Church still outlawed Freemasonry, with some arguing that the Catholic view had or can change. This led to a series of official statements from the Catholic Church reaffirming the traditional Catholic view against Freemasonry. For example, in the late 1960s, the Scandinavian Catholic Bishops Conference claimed that the Swedish Rite of Freemasonry was more compatible with Catholic teaching than other forms of Freemasonry, and thus allowed converts to Catholicism from Protestantism to retain their membership in the Freemasons, but only with the permission of their local bishop. In 1968, Cardinal Franz Koning, the Archbishop of Vienna, met with representatives of local Freemasonic lodges, and together they agreed to initiate an investigation to determine the extent to which Freemasonry and Catholicism were compatible. The document produced was highly criticized by the Church for being theologically and philosophically faulty, and thus was never publicly or officially endorsed by Cardinal Koning. In 1971, Bishop Daniel Pezeril, the Auxiliary Bishop of Paris, delivered a lecture at a Freemasonic Lodge in Paris, the first time in which a Catholic bishop had taken part in a Masonic event since the first papal ban on Freemasonry in the early 18th century. Around the same time, the Italian Jesuit priest Father Giovanni Caprile, 
published an article in the Jesuit publication La Civilita Catolica praising Bishop Pezzeril's actions, asserting that while there are definite and major differences in belief between the Freemasons and the Catholic Church, these are not insurmountable, and thus questioned whether or not Catholics who joined the Freemasons should be excommunicated. In response to all of this, the Congregation for the Doctrine of Faith published a declaration in 1983 in which it stated that, quote, the Church's negative judgment in regard to Masonic associations remains unchanged since their principles have always been considered irreconcilable with the doctrines of the Catholic Church, and therefore membership in them remains forbidden." Unquote. A similar situation influenced the Congregation for the Doctrine of Faith's more recent document on Freemasonry, published this past November. More specifically, this document was written in response to a request for clarification from Bishop Julito Cortez, a bishop of the Diocese of Dumaguete in the Philippines, who noted that there was a substantial membership in Freemasonry in the Philippines, and that some were asserting that there is no conflict between traditional Catholic teaching and membership in Masonic lodges. The recent CDF document concluded, quote, On the doctrinal level, it should be remembered that active membership in Freemasonry by a member of the faithful is forbidden because of the irreconcilability between Catholic doctrine and Freemasonry. Therefore, those who are formally and knowingly enrolled in Masonic lodges and have embraced Masonic principles fall under the provisions in the above-mentioned declaration. These measures also apply to any clerics enrolled in Freemasonry." Unquote. The document went on to say that the bishops of the Philippines thus had a pastoral duty to discern more efficient ways of catechizing the people, so that they can better understand the irreconcilability of church teaching and the teachings of the Freemasons. What can we learn from all of this? Well, a lot of people think of the Freemasons as being nothing more than a gentleman's club, something similar to the quote-unquote lodges formed by retired old men. And in practice, that is what the Freemasons have essentially become. The Freemasons have essentially become a gentleman's club, and beyond just being another social club, they also do do some good, including charitable work including, most famously, an extensive network of hospitals. The thing is, the Freemasons are not, by nature, a charitable organization or a gentleman's club. The organization does have certain elements of a religion, including a hierarchical structure, rituals, and a very well-defined spirituality, something which we can see in the fact that belief in God is necessary for membership in the Freemasons. They hold to a well-defined set of beliefs, many of which are in opposition with, or irreconcilable with, the official teachings of the Catholic Church. And while the average Freemason may not be all that well acquainted with the history and teachings of their organization, or actively be looking to subvert the Church, something that a lot of Freemasons and Masonic-affiliated or Masonic-influenced organizations at one point did try to do, the Freemasons have not to this day changed or reversed their official teachings. This thus showcases the need for moral vigilance and an understanding of the faith. All that we do, including the sorts of organizations or institutions that we associate with, must be examined in light of the spiritual and moral truths revealed by Christ. There cannot be any association between light and darkness, truth and falsehood, but rather we must shed the light of God's truth on all things, on all events, on all actions, on all teachings, on all individuals and all organizations, in order to draw people closer to their Creator and Redeemer.